This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning and welcome to the Mara Triangle in Kenya where we are amongst the massive herds of wildebeest and the migration. My name is Steve and this is Wild Wonderland. Absolutely magnificent. This is happening, folks. This is 100% live. Here we are. We're watching the migration story unfold. Here's a lion. There's a lion right next to us. Oh, that was close. You can't possibly script something like this. Good morning and welcome to CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show. My name is James Hendry. I've got James on camera. He's twice the size of me. And it's a wonderful privilege to have you on safari with us in Africa. We are coming to you live from three magnificent locations here. The Masai Mara in Kenya. A little bit to the south of us, the Serengeti in Tanzania. And way to the south of that, the Western Kruger in South Africa. Over here, we have got three buffalo bulls who have made it through the night. They're very happy about that. Now, while you look at them, it is important that I tell you, you are the most important part of a live safari. And so we'd love to hear from you. Please send us your questions or your comments. And you can do that on Twitter to the hashtag CGTNWild or the hashtag Wild Wonderland. So that's on Twitter, hashtag CGTN Wild or hashtag Wild Wonderland. Any questions or comments about the magnificent animals that we have here live from Africa, we'd love to have. Now, you've seen with Steve those enormous herds of wildebeest. This is the highlight of the East African year, the migration of two million wildebeest and zebra and Thompson's gazelles. The red oat grass plains of the Mara Serengeti sway in anticipation. In February, around 400,000 wildebeest are born on the short grass of the Serengeti's southern plains. Just half an hour, the calves have found their feet. And one of nature's greatest journeys begins. From the southern plains, more than a million animals move northwest into the Serengeti's western corridor massing on the banks of the Grumeti River. As the rut ends, the herds gallop north once more. Eventually, two million grazers arrive to feast on the abundance of the Masai Mara. It begins with the trickle of the zebra vanguard, enjoying the undisturbed long grass plains, making the first crossings of the turbulent Mara River. Many fall to the rapids and the crocodiles. And then comes the main body of the migration, the thundering herds of white-bearded gnu, bleating songs of chaos in search of green pasture. The herds know the danger, but the call for food is too great. All must take the plunge. Not all will make it. For those that do, hungry prides and clans patrol the banks. For survivors, rich red oat grass is the reward. Before it's time to cross the river again, as nature's greatest herd follows the life-giving storms and verdant plains of the Mara Serengeti for nourishment. The Mara Triangle, everybody. We just had a lioness in the long grass. When we arrived here, we found her hunting this enormous herd of wildebeest. And now she's decided to get shy and hide for us. But my name is Steve Falkenbridge. I'm joined by jean Dre Gehring on camera. And welcome to the Mara. We are here with the enormous herds of wildebeest that are over my right hand shoulder. I'm just going to move forward for you so you can see them. We do have a lion that has disappeared. She was chasing them and the herds were moving we're moving like a big shoal of sardines being hunted by dolphins and it is quite an interesting sight to see and so from a distance we managed to scan and we saw the lioness within the herd and now they've moved some four or five hundred meters from where she was originally hunting them 
and they're starting to calm down again. But we're going to make our way over there into the herds there, see if we can find some more predators, maybe trying to pick them off. This is the migration underway in full swing in the Mara Triangle. All the herds thoroughly enjoying the beautiful green red oat grass. Linda, it is incredible these scenes that we are seeing here. We are thoroughly, thoroughly spoilt to be able to spend time with these massive herds of wildebeest. And of course, the lions are trying to hunt them. It's part and parcel of the uh, migration and the circle of life. But uh, just being able to witness this bulk of herbivores on the open plains is thoroughly, thoroughly, well, should I say, exceptional. Well, all the way down in South Africa, my good friend Jamie is out on foot this morning and she has got a buffalo. I have got several buffalo all gathered together at the water's edge and this is such a spectacular way to spend a morning. Uh, my name is Jamie and I'm just meters away with a Craig behind the camera from one of Africa's most dangerous animals to encounter on foot. Fortunately for us, this is a herd of buffalo and not a solitary buffalo, which means that we're a little bit safer up where we are. We're up on a termite mound and as I told you, we are on foot. So I'm keeping my voice very, very low. And buffalo have notoriously bad eyesight, but they can hear extremely well and they can smell very well. And already this herd is suspicious. But out here in South Africa, it is our dry season and water is limited. This is one of the few remaining water sources for them. So despite the fact that they feel that there's something watching them, which is us, of course, their thirst is stronger than their fear and they've all gathered together the dust the golden sunlight it is such a spectacular contrast to the green and lush verdant area of the Masai Mara there's a couple of cows that have looked at us and every now and again they seem to want to walk towards us to see what we're doing our big animals are abounding here in South Africa Lauren is not far away from us and she's with some elephants Welcome everybody. I am not too far away from Jamie at all and we have came across a huge mixed breeding herd of elephants that are currently traveling along to have their breakfast this morning on this chilly morning. My name is Lauren and on camera today I do have Seb and there's a lot of them and they're just going across the road in front of us right now as they're going from tree to tree, shrub to shrub to feed for the morning. Now it's very, very, very cold for me, but of course the elephants are keeping moving and they're just expanding and walking across this huge wonderland in the Sabi Sands from water to vegetation to water to vegetation. Now this herd will be led by the matriarch, but it's very, very difficult to point out which one is the matriarch. She will be the oldest and most knowledgeable female that has all this knowledge of the environment and she will lead the herd through their daily activities. Normally she's the largest but not always so it's very very difficult for us to say which one is the matriarch without actually watching them for a very long time. Now there are some juveniles in this herd as well and of course they stay protected under the adults normally in the center of the herd because all the females together protect the young ones. So we're going to stay with these elephants a little bit longer to see what they get up to. And while we do that, we're going to send you back up to the Masai Mara.
very good to see elephants, especially here in the morning. Jambo, jambo, hello, hello, ni hao, ni hao. How is everybody doing? Welcome to another part of the Masimara where I am not showing you like the buffaloes you've been uh, seeing uh, with James or let's say the willibees you've been seeing with Steve and the elephants that you just uh, saw um, with Lauren. I'm showing you something different and I'm showing you a huge bird which is called an ostrich. My name is David and very excited to have you on board. Now the big bird we have there, the ostrich, is the largest bird we have in the world. Remember, we're coming to you live from the Mara Triangle and this is CGTN Wild Wonderland. Should you have any questions, ladies and gentlemen, you're always more than welcome to ask uh, using hashtags CGTN Wild and hashtag Wild Wonderland. Comments too are very welcome. You might ask me which sex is slat ostrich. Is it a male and a female? That's a very good question. I'd be more than happy to answer because we've got so many bird species here in Kenya and the small ones are always rather difficult to tell males from females. But for the ostriches, it is black and white. That one there, it's a male because it's incidentally black and white in color. How interesting is that? Now, if you see a female, of that particular species of an ostrich, it is grayish, brownish in color. Now, look at his neck carefully. It's very pink. And being pink like that, it shows it is in breeding plumage. That's wonderful. And what happens is when they get that particular coloration, it's a breeding uh, pl 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 plumage, they'll be looking for, for some females to mate with. My plans today or this morning is to look for some lions for you and as I do that I'll take you to the other side of the Mara to my friend James who got some elephants for you. It's just been an action-packed start to this CGTN Wild Wonderland live show extravaganza here live of course from three magnificent locations in africa we're sitting with a huge herd of elephants here it's probably two or three herds that have come together into a marshy area to enjoy the fertile grass that's growing here and i just want you to listen carefully because what you can hear apart from a tourist vehicle which is obviously part of this ecosystem, as much as we are, and as much as these elephants are, is the tearing of the grass, and maybe the tweeting of the birds. And maybe you heard that, which is the noise that elephants make to talk to each other. Now the one on the left here, moving closer towards us, there she is, over there, is probably the matriarch of the group in front. She lifted her trunk up to smell us. She wants to make sure that we are not a threat to any of the animals that she is responsible for. Have a question from consulting detective and please remember you can ask any questions that you'd like to using the hashtag cgtn wild or the hashtag wild wonderland on twitter it's about whether or not the herds here in the Masai Mara and in the Serengeti are bigger than the ones down in the western Kruger and the answer is they're actually very similar sized eight to twelve individuals is normally the size led by a matriarch and then what you get in a situation like we have here is an agglomeration or a joining of two or three herds where they could be quite closely related to each other and they've joined up just because the food is all in the right place and they're probably all going to head slowly slowly down towards the Mara River where they'll have a drink. Elephants do need to drink once sometimes twice a day depending on how wet the vegetation they're eating is and there's communication going on here all the time. Sometimes it's so low, the sound is so low frequency that we can't hear it, but the elephants can hear it. Just beautiful. 
Now, Africa is an enormously diverse continent. It goes from pure deserts of the Sahara to the incredible rainforests of the Congo. And the three locations that we're in here have a vastly differing geography. Africa's unique and stunning ecosystems have formed over countless eons. The Mara Serengeti lies in the fertile space between the Great and Western Rift Valleys. Violent tectonic upheaval and volcanic deposits have created a fertile paradise. The Mara Serengeti ecosystem supports nutritious grasslands and savannas which nourish an abundance of animal life that beggars belief. The highlight of the year is the movement of the great wildebeest migration. Some 1.2 million of these antelope make the return journey from the southern plains of the Serengeti to the Masai Mara every year. They relish the rich red oat grass and risk the rapids and crocodiles of the Mara River. Juma, in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa, is even more ancient than the Mara Serengeti. Its sandy soils support a variety of woodland habitats. Made famous by the elusive prince of cats, the leopard. The thickets and clearings are home to myriad small creatures, many working ceaselessly. Some at a more leisurely pace. The colours, textures, smells and sounds of East and South Africa are equally beautiful and exquisitely unique. And you are live with us again in the Mara Triangle with the herds. We do get leopards up in the Mara, we just don't see them as often as we do down in the Sabi Sands. But up here, the migration in full swing, lions and hyenas are making, making hay while the sun shines. There are absolutely so many animals out on the plains here. We've been passing herd after herd this morning. Noel, you want to know how many wildebeest there are? And they reckon within the migration, there's about 1.3 million wildebeest somewhere around there. I'm not sure how exactly they work that out. But uh, with the, the zebra that also take part in the migrations, anywhere from six to 700,000 zebra as well as Topi, Thompson's gazelle, um, Grant's gazelle. There are just so many animals moving, but by, by, most, by, by most parts, the wildebeest are taking up all of the space on the landscape and they are the most notable. The noises that they're making, the constant bellows as they move through the long grass, it's almost deafening at times. So much so that the elephants move off. We don't see any elephants near these migration herds. What exactly they're trying to say to each other, I'm really not sure. But it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. And we're looking through this herd to see if we can find some more predators. That lioness we had decided she'd had enough for the morning. And she went and lay down next to a little drainage stream in the cool shade and long grass probably been chasing these herds for hours although not hungry the lions and hyenas can't help themselves this time of year with just so much abundance of food on the open plains they just chase everything they'll even kill things not even eat them it's just that instinct to just catch and catch and catch Okay, well, we're going to try and dissect this herd one more time. See if we can find you some moving lions. And in the meantime, Lauren is thoroughly enjoying a morning with elephants. The sun is finally starting to warm us up a little bit here in South Africa. And we're still here in this very moment with all of these elephants surrounding us on either side of the road and of course the elephants in the Mara and in Juma are the same they're both African elephants but they differ in a few ways and one of the main things is their diet 
Because of the environment in the Mara, elephants eat about 80% soft grasses, soft, delicious grasses. However, in Juma, it changes between the seasons. So it differs between grass and trees and shrubs. So we have a question, Vicky Young, how much food does an elephant eat per day? Well, it eats a lot, a lot, a lot of food. Uh, depends on the size of the animal, but generally they can eat up to about 160 to 200 kg of sort of green plant matter per day. Not only that, they drink copious amounts of water. They suck it up with their trunk and they swallow it. But they've got quite an ineffective digestive system. So they do indeed not process plant matter very well. So I think they only digest about 40% of what they eat. So when you look at elephant dung, you can actually see that there's a lot of material there that hasn't quite properly been digested. So they eat a lot. This herd that we've been watching now are just moving and eating, moving and eating, using that really powerful trunk to sort of grab at the trees and shrubs and put it into their mouth. So it looks like Jamie, who's literally not too far away, is still with her buffalo. I'm really not too far away from Lauren at all, and we're still with our buffalo. We are actually essentially trapped up here where we are if we move now we will scare them and that is several tons of collective buffalo so we definitely don't want to do that laura's just been telling you about how much elephants drink while well, buffalo are also incredibly water dependent which means that they have to move between the various water sources and the herd is starting slowly to move away and the ones that haven't had a chance to drink are taking their opportunity what you often find is that there's a lot of pushing and shoving in the beginning because the buffalo are very thirsty you'll notice that of course i'm lying down on this termite mound and that's so that the buffalo don't see my outline they don't see particularly well but they would pick up on movement and they would pick up on our shape so it's important that I make sure that I stay as flat as possible down onto the ground so that they don't in any way shift about. There's actually, I'm trying to keep my eye now as the herd is moving around and spreading out. There's a couple of individuals that have actually looped around us and are very, very close to our termite mound, but on our left-hand side. So we've essentially become surrounded by a buffalo. That's a big old bull. They tend to be the more dangerous ones of the herd. Remember, if you have any questions and would like to contact us, you can do that on hashtag CGT and Wild or hashtag Wild Wonderland. Can you believe you are watching this happen right here and right now? But there's too much to choose from this morning. David has managed to find one of my favorite animals up in the Masai Mara. It is very true, you know, I mean, saying we are live and I got her favorite animals in the Mara for Jamie. She has always loved to follow uh, hyenas. Did you hear me there? Now, what we got there are about four or five hyena cubs, ladies and gentlemen. And what they're doing, they're just sunning themselves. And hyenas live in what we call a den. And because we follow our animals very well here in the Mara Triangle, we happen to know, for example, the cheetahs, the lions, the leopards, and the hyenas around here. Now, this particular group of hyenas and a group of hyena is called a clan. This particular clan is called the Happy Zebra Clan. We've got so many clans in the Mara Triangle, but one of the largest clans is called the North Clan, but I'm quite a distance from that clan, so I thought I'll swing by here and find out whether we'd be lucky to see this particular clan and how lucky to have all those cubs out 
sunning themselves. When I see a den, I see they live like in holes. And those holes are always, should there be a concern, they can very quickly go into the holes and get some cover. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a look and learn a little bit more about hyenas. The spotted hyena has a reputation as a sinister, thieving scavenger. This, as we have come to realize, is utter nonsense. Rather, hyenas are highly intelligent, affectionate and resourceful creatures. They live in matriarchal clans centered around a den. Like a female-dominated village where the cubs play and learn their social place under the protection of a chieftainess and her subjects. Young cubs are cute, but scrappy and tough. Males are at the bottom of the social pile. Sometimes they loiter about the den, but mostly they forage away from the mums and kids. As with all animals, there is a chilling side to hyena. They are viciously territorial, and there is no mercy for those who challenge the hierarchy. Although the clans continue to dispute their reputation as devious scavengers, we are often reminded why they are one of the most feared predators in all of nature. You are back live with us on the CGTN Wild Wonderland live show where we are still watching the herds massing in the distance with the cleanup crew in the front of house here. A variety of vultures that have been picking up the scraps left by the lions and hyenas but also there are lots of animals that die naturally. The migration is quite a stressful time in fact lots of pressure um, if the river doesn't get them, the crocodiles don't get them, the lions and hyenas don't get them, some of them die of illness and injury and old age even. And, uh, well, sad we've even got one that's lying flat in the grass that is clearly, clearly dead. And the vultures will be doing most of the work for cleaning it all up. Maureen, you want to know how long they will be staying on this side? Well, probably for the next month to two months, maybe even three months, depending on the rain that we have. But bearing in mind the river crossing that they have, they actually do come across the river and cross back again. They don't just cross once. It's not just this one-way street. They cross once and they're constantly crossing back again over the next few months as they keep thinking the grass is greener on the other side. And then eventually after probably about October time, that's what time it happened last year, they'll all start heading back south again as the rains fall in the southern Serengeti. Uh, where they'll all start moving back down south in preparation for the next season of calves. But of course, the rain can change. Um, fire is the driving force with the rain that provides the beautiful green, fresh grass. And if there's been a massive fire somewhere, that can quite often attract the wildebeest to stay a little bit longer. Now, talking about the other side of the river and talking about in the Serengeti, Tristan is not far away and he's with some herds of his own. Indeed we are and it is super, super exciting to be in the Serengeti in Tanzania and be on both sides of the border where the wildebeest are going. So it's very, very cool able to follow them no matter which side of or which country they're in. My name is Tristan as Steve mentioned and I've got David Hello. on a camera and it is a very very warm welcome to all of you to this side of the world. You can see we've got a small small herd of wildebeest at the moment. Um, this herd is sort of the remaining numbers that are here. Many, many, many of the wildebeest have crossed north towards the Masai Mara at the moment. So they cross over the Mara River that flows east-west just to the north of where we are currently and then they head up into the Mara 
Tikva. But you can see the landscape here is very different to that of the Masai Mara. It is inundated with these incredible rocky outcrops and it is an absolutely beautiful part of the world. So Rainbow D, yes, the wildebeest only give birth in the Serengeti. So around February, they head to the short grass plains in the southern part of the Serengeti and they will give birth in that area. What's interesting is that this year, they actually didn't make it all the way there. Um, made it only to about the central Serengeti where they gave birth, which is quite interesting. And that's all due to kind of rainfall that takes place. But isn't that just the most magnificent landscape it really is one of my favorite, favorite reserves to spend time in in Africa. These big boulders just make the most dramatic um, landscape for these guys. Right, we're going to carry on looking, seeing what else we can find. In the meantime, though, let's send you all the way down to South Africa with Lauren and those big gray patterns. We are still with this herd of elephants and this little young one here keeps trying to suckle from its mother. It's a very young elephant, possibly even at the year mark. And of course, keeps trying to suckle into mummy while mummy is absolutely feeding on all the trees and shrubs around, which is amazing. There's also elephants that keep crossing the road in front of us and they're very relaxed, not nervous at all of our presence. And you can hear them, you can hear them from really, really far away because they're crackling and crunching all the branches using their trunks. And of course, it's hard to imagine what having a trunk would feel like, but it's basically just formed by merging of the nose and the muscles of the upper lip. And that's what creates this really, really sensitive long organ. So it's almost like an arm a nose and a straw, shall we say. Janine's asking, do female elephants fight with other females? Generally, fe elephant societies are heard are female dominated, they're female led, and they're normally all related. So they do not fight really in comparison to the males. The males do fight, they get a little bit boisterous, especially, especially as they get older, and they normally get ousted from the herd around 12 to 15 years of age. But the females can have disputes. The older females can tell the younger females off. Sometimes they will be naughty and the matriarch is always, always in control of that. So we have seen matriarchs sort of tell the younger females off, but it's not fighting like the males would do. The males butt heads, if you like, clash and generally sort of fight using their trunks but it's really, really nothing in comparison, but they do have disputes. This is a very fission fusion society. It's very dynamic. And even although this herd is completely separated amongst us on the right and the left, they will be communicating with one another constantly. Oh, what a fantastic yet chilly morning. So we're gonna stay with this herd of elephants. You guys are gonna go up to steep with a herd of wildebeest. The herds are still here everybody and well the sun is shining it's a beautiful morning in the Mara Triangle and the beautiful scene right here next to this little drainage stream and my name is Steve once again joined by Jandre and how blessed are we to be experiencing these scenes in front of us over here. I know it's one of those things we, people come from all over the world to see, see the wildebeest migration, of course the predators and all the other animals that come with it make for some spectacular moments as the animals move through. You can see the massive herds here all grazing on the very green grass, quite a contrast to down in South Africa where there has been no rain. James, you want to know what it smells like in amongst the herds? Well, when we started with that lioness before, we were actually surrounded by what like, smelled like rumen stomach content, which is quite a foul sort of sour smell. There's nothing quite like the smell of an animal's stomach 
that has been opened and uh, that together mixed with the tingle of wildebeest droppings all over the place made for a very nice sort of smell in the morning. Uh, the wildebeest droppings on mass like this almost smell like a milking shed. If you've ever milked a cow, if you've ever spent time in your gumboots uh, with a whole lot of cattle, that is kind of what it smelled like, um, come mixed with the smell of death and stomach content. So I hope that doesn't turn your tummy in this early morning. So we are not far at all from the lifeblood of this Mara system, the Mara River. And with the animals crossing, it makes for some spectacular sights. Rising on the northwestern edge of the Great Rift Valley and flowing into Lake Victoria some 400 kilometers later, the Mara River is a rich vein of life running through one of the world's most famous wilderness areas. Shaped and fed by African thunderstorms, rapids, pools and banks provide sustenance to myriad creatures. For the wildebeest, zebra and gazelle of the Great Migration, the Mara River is the quencher of thirst also a fatal gauntlet. The herds must cross the torrent in search of grazing. But beneath the muddy surface lurk some of the world's largest crocodiles. They have been waiting for the migration for almost a year. For those that survive the rapids, rocks and crocodiles, pastures of sweet oat grass await. Welcome back live. Now we are quite close to the river and we've got one of the animals that I think is possibly the most sought after by tourists coming to this area. It is of course the Maasai giraffe. Beautiful creature there. My name is James Hendry. We've got Big James on camera today and I'm just going to be quiet for a second. What you can hear there is a ring-necked dove in a tree just next to us. It's very beautiful. Let's go back to our giraffe over there. You were talking about the smells with Steve of the wildebeest herd. I think they smell like goats myself, a little bit like a sort of mixture between goat and leather. But also the sounds out here are so amazing. You've heard them in amongst the wildebeest herd, that bang, 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 away from the herds, a bit of wind, Always a bird calling somewhere, Rufus Snape lark going <whistles> or a dove like the one you can hear there, the river rolling over the rocks, the grunt of hippos <laughs> and all of these things mean that although there is no human sound, it's never quite silent here in this unbelievably beautiful landscape. We are of course live from the Masai Mara in Kenya. Oh, we've got a whole herd there of Thompson's gazelles. Now they are part of the migration. Some of them stay here all year long and some of them come with the migration. And the question is why are they running? Are they running because one of the little rams is trying to herd some females or have they seen a predator? There are also some warthogs there. Just keep going, there are some warthogs. Amazing abundance of animals. They're all looking in the same direction could they maybe have seen a lion or a cheetah or a hyena? And the giraffes looking in the same direction. We might have to drive up there and have a look. I can see another vehicle up there and they... Oh, it's a hyena. If we go to the right of, of the giraffe, just keep going right there, James. We can see the hyena. It's moving along there. There it is, there, just to the right-hand side, two hyenas. That's what everything was running wrong, or running from. 
Okay, we're going to see if we can get a little bit closer to those hyenas or maybe to the river. Let's go back down to South Africa where Jamie Patterson is very bravely sitting with a herd of buffalo. At this point, I'm not even sure it's very brave of us because, to be honest, there's nothing much that we could do, even if we wanted to. Uh, you are watching Wild Wonderland, and what that means is that what you're seeing is happening right here and right now in South Africa, where we are meters from a herd of Cape buffalo, which might look a little bit like cows, but I can promise you are absolutely nothing like them. They're an entirely separate animal. They're 100% wild, and they are massive. Uh, my name is Jamie and behind the camera is Craig. And if you ask me, this is the best possible way to spend a morning sitting in the sun on a chilly, chilly morning. It's winter here in South Africa, so it is cold. And watching a herd of buffalo come to drink a little moment earlier, they actually spotted us and they are staring across at us at the moment, trying to work out what we are and if we're a lion or a threat. Dina, you want to know if the buffalo join in the migration? And the answer to that is no. They actually stay resident in one place. And you get these big herds like this. Here in South Africa, we of course don't have a big migration of animals. But you, what you will find is that the buffalo herds will move from place to place to find food. And every year, the rain falls more in a different place, which means that it's never predictable exactly where the buffalo are going to be. It's been three hard years of dry seasons. We've actually been stuck in a drought. So for these buffalo, they've actually got very little to eat. But they play an incredibly important part of the ecosystem in terms of their grazing habits. It's just very tough for them up here in the northern section, away from any of the rivers. They struggle to find themselves a sufficient water in order to survive. And right now they're starting to move off. I can actually hear an elephant not uh, too far away. So while I sit and wait to see whether or not we get lucky, and an elephant pops out as well. Lauren already has hers. Let's go and see what they're doing. Jamie, it probably is our elephants that we are still sitting here with because they're not exactly small or quiet animals to say the least. And of course, this herd is just bigger than I originally thought. The elephants keep coming through the thickets faster and faster. Very relaxed and of course, just looking for food. You can see them picking up the grass with its trunk as it walks along. Now the grass, because we are in the grips of winter, there's not much sort of delicious palatable grasses around, which is why they are now eating the trees and the shrubs. Carol's asking if the earth rumbles when elephants communicate. Well, fascinatingly enough, they communicate in so many different ways. Now, the ways that humans can sort of see is the body posturing, the noises, the trumpeting and the screeching. But you're right, they do also communicate through really, really low-pitched rumbling. And these rumblings are sort of produced by the vocal cords and they're obviously amplified by that upper region of the trunk. Now, we can hear some rumbling and you're right, it vibrates right through you. You can really feel it when the elephants rumble. It's an amazing feeling that resonates right through. But not all of these rumbles are actually heard by humans. There are infrasonic messages as well that occur at wavelengths that we can't even hear. So they're constantly communicating, which is incredible. So as we continue to enjoy this wonderful morning here with the elephants, we're going to send you guys back up to the Maasai Mara. Well, we're actually in the Serengeti and you can see that we're sitting with a flock of vultures. Now, generally when you're close to wildebeest herds, these guys are very, very, very close by. And especially in this area where you get a lot of rocks, you often find them roosting for the night up on these rocks. And then they come down and they'll wait until... 
it gets a little bit warmer and the sort of thermal start to rise and then they can get up and go and try and find any of the wildebeest that have possibly succumbed during the course of the night. For those of you that have just joined us, my name is Tristan and we have got probably my favorite vulture sitting on a termite mound closest to us. It's the lapid face vulture, which is the largest of the vultures that we get in this particular area. It is a beautiful, beautiful big bird. You can see it's got that chunky big beak and that sort of reddish colored head, which makes it easily tied in. Um, they are quite common in this area and you see them quite regularly and these guys are really the brutes of the vulture world they'll kind of bully everybody else Janine are vultures endangered yes so pretty much every single vulture within the African system is now considered endangered um, their numbers have declined heavily and that is due to a number of reasons some of it is because of the fact that um, a lot of habitat loss has taken place but also because of stock farming when vultures come along they often feed on poisoned carcasses um, and they they then obviously get poisoned and can die from that and then on top of it there's a lot of them that hit power lines so anywhere where there's power lines that are running they hit them and, and unfortunately die from that so their numbers have really decreased quite badly and it's led to a massive reduction in the number of birds um, within all the vulture species now you can see that vulture species on top is a different species that is called a rupel's vulture easy to identify with a little pink edging their beak they are also very 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 pretty as far as vultures go good we're going to carry on and see if these guys maybe have a carcass nearby maybe there's something that's dead and they might be feeding on so while we investigate let's send you back across to steve with the masses of wildebeest in the mara thanks tristan indeed the vultures are everywhere well, our wildebeest herd is moving away from us, as you can see all the bottoms, and they are mowing the lawn. It's quite incredible how quickly they are able to defoliate the grasslands that we have here. Only a few days ago, this area was lush and green with lots of grass, but 10, 20,000 wildebeest moving across it, all munching as they go, mow the grass down nice and short. And in, in amongst the herd, can see there's a few youngsters that have quite well camouflaged in amongst them which makes it quite tricky for the lions to pick out there's a little baby there a little youngsters E.T. bush lover you want to know if these noises continue they continue all throughout the day all throughout the night they just seemingly don't stop it is actually it's quite deafening and um, I think soon we're actually going to start dreaming of the sounds of wildebeest bellows at night time. It's just an incessant sound. And you see not many animals hang around the wildebeest. You'll find some zebra, maybe some topi. And the topi seem to move off to the side and keep out of the herd. As we said before, the elephants disappear altogether. And you don't really see any buffalo near the herds. The herds attract the predators have huge sounds and also they mow the grass down. You can see a huge herd moving at the back there in one long line. We're going to go and have a look at that because sometimes when they're moving like that it indicates predators may be moving along the side and they bunch together. So we're going to go have a look over there and while we do that let's go a little bit further north to James who's looking at some giraffe. This giraffe is finding us very, very interesting indeed. They are very curious animals, and somewhere in the grass in front of the giraffe, those two hyenas are lurking. But I don't know exactly where, I don't. Wouldn't surprise me if they found something to eat. It is warming up now, which means they could also go to sleep in the long grass for the duration of the heat of the day. And this giraffe will probably head down slowly towards the river. We have actually got a topi as well. I'm not sure if James can get it. Can you get that or why am I... Do I need to go back a bit? I'm just going to go a little bit back because I know Steve was talking about a topi and he was talking about the fact that the wildebeest don't... Whoa! 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 <laughs> just close. We nearly uh, turned the car over there. Let's try and... <laughs> We're a little bit stuck here. James, um, do you want to come and stand on this side of the car with your heavy weight? I think even more, if you wouldn't mind. 
There we go. All right, we'll try and get out of this position and you go back to Steve. <laughs> Good luck getting out there, James. Be careful. We are now parting the waves of wildebeest, the ocean of wildebeest in amongst us. And some of them have got youngsters that have blended in quite nicely. The colors are very similar to that of the adults. And they need to change color very quickly because when they're that sort of lighter brown color, they stand out quite easily and are much easily picked off by the predators. Uh, the young wildebeest, when they are carved out on the plains of the Serengeti, need to be able to keep up with the herds within 20, 15, 20 minutes after giving birth. And there's masses of the youngsters all looking the same color. And um, they need to quickly change color and sort of blend in with the herd, which makes them harder to spot. But we've seen a few amongst here that are a bit late. Um, they're a little bit lighter in color and they would eat be the targets for predators that would be moving in the herds, looking for always the weak, the young, and the easy catch. So plenty of prey available, and the flooding of the market is the strategy of the wildebeest, with having thousands of babies at the same time, many of them manage to survive. Okay, well David is a little bit further south, I don't think he's with any of the herds because he has found himself some elephant. Well, from the herds of wildebeest now to herds of elephants. And this is the magic of the Mara, where you can see animals in very huge numbers. For those of you who would be joining us now on this uh, CGTN World Wonderland live show from the Mara Triangle, my name is David, and of course, always very excited to have you on board. Now, we've got a very huge herd of elephants here. And also remember, should you have any questions or comments, please do send them through hashtag CGTN Wild or hashtag Wild Wonderland. Janine, how are you today? And you're asking, where do elephants go during the migration? The elephants, Janine, are always here. They do not go anywhere, but I'll tell you something, and I'm sure maybe Steve might have pointed out. Elephants, ideally, they don't like mixing with wildebeest. And at one point, I'm sure Steve stopped talking and you heard all, eh, 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 all that from the wildebeest. The elephants get very irritated by that. So unless they have to mingle or they have like to be in one common place, elephants will always to be away or they like being away from the wildebeest because the wildebeest are always very vocal and rarely they keep quiet unless when they are resting. But any given time, they are always vocalizing and making a lot of noise. Now in this classical herd of elephants, I'm sure they are males and females and we could be seeing also calves in this particular herd. So I want to move forward a little bit and find out whether they are going to have a drink or not. But in the meantime, we'll take you to Jimmy who got a buffalo. Our buffaloes have had their drink at this stage and are now wandering off into the distance. And we're left with just a couple of stragglers who have stayed behind to quench their thirst. Can you believe that? That means that we are almost, almost out of the woods, although we've got to be incredibly careful as we move out of here because the last thing we want is to bump into one of the males hanging around on his own, perhaps not feeling up to keeping up with the rest of the herd today. And those are known as Dugger Boys, the big old buffalo males, and they often spend time on their own or straggle together in groups of two or three. But because they don't have the safety of the herd, they feel a little bit more uncomfortable and therefore can be potentially more dangerous. Well, there's all sorts of amazing things that happen out here, but I've mentioned that the buffalo have struggled their way through the dry season. That applies to all of the animals that have survived the drought in South Africa. Bye. 
the summer of 2015 and 2016 was the hottest and driest in 110 years. All life depends on water. So in the semi-arid Western Kruger, a failure of the rains is devastating. Less than one third of the average rain fell. Conflict over nature's most precious resource was intense. As woodland forage wilted, animals struggled to find sustenance. The African sun baked the land. The grass remained dormant, the herbivores began to starve, and so eventually did their predators. Scavengers took full advantage. The air remained choked with dust as the herds continued their ceaseless search for water and nourishment. Welcome back live. Now, interestingly, here in East Africa, you'll find that the weather is not quite as extreme as it is down south in South Africa, which means that we don't often have drought here. There is a dry season and a wet season, but oh, there's a long wet season and a long dry season and a short wet season and a short dry season, but very seldom is there a heavy drought like we get down in South Africa. We are now on the banks of the very famous Mara River. There are a lot of hippo in this river, more than a thousand between where it enters the park and exits into the Serengeti. And there are also those most terrifying of water creatures, the crocodile. And we've got one big one off to the side there, just making his way towards the bank. Shinyu, yes, there is a huge decrease in antelope numbers after the migration moves. Remember that they all head back down south, so we'll lose about 2 million of the grazers down into the Serengeti. But the elephants will return into the area and the buffalo will come back out onto the plains. Remember, they kind of move off into the mountains and onto the riverbanks when the migration is in town. Now that crocodile is licking his lips because very shortly those big wildebeest herds are going to come up to this area and this is one of the main crossing points on the northern reaches of the Mara River and these crocodiles are very famous for grabbing at the wildebeest. Now I'm not sure if over the next 14 episodes or so we might have a crossing up here. In about a week I'm expecting the wildebeest to make it this far up north so we might be very lucky. The hippo, well they just kind of watch the migration season. They don't really change their behavior very much. When the crossings happen they kind of get out the way but then they're very interested in what goes on when they're being attacked by the crocodiles. And I just want to quickly show you one tiny little crocodile there who's not going to play a big role in the migration at all. He's a very small fellow. He's just about, oh, he's probably only about a meter and a half long. As you look at him, let's go back down to Steve, who is with those herds, and they are hopefully going to come up this way. Thanks, James. We're still following the herds as they are converging either side of us into this massive big snake. There are other vehicles out in the Mara, many vehicles coming here to witness the spectacle that is the migration. Walking along the open plains, beautiful big line. We're scanning for predators, but I think they're all rather full 
after the last five, six days or so of the magic that has been the migration and they're all just hiding or sleeping in the shade somewhere but we're going to keep seeing if we can follow them because what a spectacle this is indeed moving in one long column in huge groups together to try and avoid predation but uh, quite often the lions and hyenas take advantage of these massive groupings and just charge in and grip them down because they're all together. They're not as vigilant as if they were in smaller groups. They all think someone else is watching. But what a opening show to this 14-part series. We have thoroughly enjoyed showing you the scenes of the Mara. We will be again with you this afternoon at 5 o'clock Eastern African time. Thanks for your questions and comments. See you then. Good day. Goodbye.